much. I uh, uh, want to acknowledge the fact that um, most of that you heard was, was uh, true, but uh, a lot of it was uh, not, not properly put in the right perspective. Um, sounds like that I started out in a big way. We started out in a very small way. We bought two Charlotte cows in 1969. And uh, I'm not a farm boy. Um, my dad was an antique dealer. I was not raised on a farm. I was raised on a, a two acre house and lot down in Durham County. I did go to a small country high school with a good ag, ag teacher. And uh, by the time I left home, I had that home place, uh, what open land there was there, cleared and fenced, and then Kentucky 31 fescue with four, four pole heifer, heifers on it, uh, cows on it. Um, so that was the humble beginning that we had. Um, I'm really a product of North Carolina Extension. Um, I did not go to ag school, I went to engineering school. Um, uh, so uh, uh, everything that I've learned about the farm and, and uh, cattle has been through uh, applications of trial and error on the farm and what I've learned uh, from the... Uh, well, in, 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 in that regard, you know, I, um, I do want to... Uh, my first encounter with a, a uh, livestock agent was a young man named David Paul Walker who was from West Virginia. And he came to work in uh, the county that we started in, uh, which was Alamance County in North Carolina. This is where my wife is from. Um, and by the way, I'd like to make sure that you meet her because she's half the team, and uh, really the most important part of the team. And that's my wife, Miss Peggy Baldwin. She's right here on the front row monitoring everything I say, and, and I'll, <laughs> I'll get the look if I, if I say something wrong. So I don't have to worry about that. Um, uh, every time, we just heard Bill Tucker a while ago speak, and I, I was <clears throat> thinking about Bill's background and my background, and, that's a very much a common denominator between us, and that's God's providence. We all are in a, a victim of our circumstances, which God takes to a uh, uh, application of his uh, love and his um, um, influence in our life to make it providence. So he turns whatever we start out with, however, we, however we're born with, into a blessing if we will be obedient. And... Um, I want to share a little verse of scripture with you this morning. If you'd open the drawer in your room um, this morning at the, there by the bedside, you would have pulled out, pulled the drawer up, you would have seen a Bible in that drawer. Uh, said, um, Holy Bible, placed by the Gideons. And uh, I've been a member of the Gideons International, that's what this pen's all about for the last uh, 34 years. And uh, every Gideon should have a little pocket testament in his pocket uh, that he takes with him every day, so that he's got uh, handy God's word to keep in his life and also to share with others. And I want to start this talk with a with a verse of scripture that really has been uh, tremendous in my life. Mark this down somewhere. I want you to look it up when you get a chance. This is Psalms 37. Listen to what God has to say in verse 3, 4, and 5. He says, trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land. See, God's promised you, you're going to be on the land. If you trust in him and do good. And virtually thou shalt be fed. You're going to eat. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of thy heart. Wow. Whatever your heart desires, he said, I'm wanting you to have it. But you've got to delight yourself in me. Commit thy ways unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Now, that's quite a proposition, isn't it? And that's what's happened in my life, really. Um, I, um, I guess I would look back on my life, and, and the turning point in my life is when I met my wife. Um, I had gone through um, the Navy after leaving home, and... Um, I was come back and got myself at NC State in engineering school. I was a, a proud sophomore and taking a double E course, electrical engineering, engineering course. And my dad was in the hospital and, and I went to visit him. And there was three girls coming down the, the uh, corridor there that I was facing and Peggy was in the middle. 
And I just kind of glanced over at these three girls, and all of a sudden I thought I heard in a very still voice, that's the one. And I looked again, and I said, wow. And by that time she's gone by, I said, that's the one. And I uh, kind of shoved it out of my mind, and a, and a few days later I was in the hospital shaving my dad, and he used to shave with a straight razor. And I broke the shaving book, and I had to go out and, you know, get a broom and clean it up, and that was that girl. She was at the Darcy station. I said, wow, that's that same girl. And so I messed around and got her name, and, and uh, finally I said, um, can I call you? She said, you can call me, but I'm busy. <laughs> and, uh, so at any rate, I got a phone number, and I called her, and, and uh, she, was, she said she was interested in going out. She said, I'm working. I said, okay. So next week, I called again, and uh, she said, I'm working. I said, Lord, this is the second time. Now, if I call her one more time and she says she's working, I'm going to miss you in this. That time I called her. She said, yeah, I'm ready to go. I, I, I can go. So um, um, it's very important to be, uh, get your life started off right with the right mate, to have the same dream that she's got, that you've got. Now, Peggy was a farm-raised girl and a little 19-acre tobacco farm in, in Alamance County. And um, I... Uh, um, assured her and riding around NC State. We had a little Volkswagen bug and she drove back to the work after we married. Uh, and um, I was in my junior year when we married and uh, I had a little Vespa scooter we'd ride around the campus on. I'd go back to the class. And I'd put her on the scooter on the weekends and we'd end up on the back side of the, her, uh, the farms out there on NC State campus while we were the beef herd work. And I'd say, darling, one day we're gonna have a beef cattle farm. She said, yeah, yeah, big boy, you're gonna be an engineer. We, I'm not, just, just, just keep studying, you'll be all right, you know. So, um, so at any rate, uh, after we'd, we'd gotten out of school and got uh, um, about 10 years of service under my belt with Bell Laboratories, it turns out that they had me working in the facility in Peggy's hometown. And, um, and Peggy's dad had passed away early in, early in his life, and there was that little 19-acre tobacco farm sitting there when no one was doing anything with it. So the farm family said, hey, you can have this little farm if you want to. You know, you do what you want to with it. So I jumped on that, put it in grass and fenced it and uh, bought two, uh, two Charlotte heifers. Why did I buy Charlotte heifers? Well, God's providence again. Um, I'd seen a lot of cattle. In fact, I bought a few Angus cattle earlier than that. But really, when I saw the big white uh, pink nose cows, I fell in love with them. And that's the way it is with any, any situation. You fall, fall in love with them or not. So we bought the two heifers and... Um, um, here again, I, um, I did not start off big. Who would, it would make absolutely no sense at all to own a bull with just two heifers. So we learned to artificially breed. I didn't learn, I didn't learn myself to begin with. We had a good uh, dairy uh, farmer friend that we knew that could do that with ABS. So I got hooked up with ABS very early. And they started breeding my Charlotte, Charlotte females. We began to buy a few more, maybe eight or ten more along the way there, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, we ran out of room with grass on the 19 acres, rented another farm. Went down the road and rented our uncle's farm. And uh, ran out of grass there, went down the road and rented another farm. And we, keep running out, we kept running out of grass and kept expanding for the next 12, for 12 years before we ever bought a piece of land. Now what I was trying to do in that 12 years was get my ag school education. It was on the job training. I was going to every extension meeting I could reading every newsletter, every article I could, and putting into practice what I knew to do. And, um, but one of the biggest things that happened in my life was uh, I decided to uh, not buy any more females, that I was gonna raise what I, what I grew, the females that I grew out of the artificial insemination. Now, when you make a decision to do that and close your herd and say, I'm not bringing any more Genetics in my herd unless it's in a straw. You've made an awesome decision. We're still doing that. We're still doing that today. We have not uh, bought any females um, since um, probably 1978. And so um, we just bred 106 heifers uh, artificially the other day, uh, last year. They're starting to cave. I told my son last night we had six caves born yesterday. So um, what I'm trying to say is that's, that's 
this is a, a way that you can build your operation and, and not have to um, worry about somebody else's. I don't have to worry about genetics. I don't have to worry about EPDs. I'm picking the best bulls that ABS has got. I'm bringing that genetics in my herd every year, okay? Uh, what that's allowed me to do was create a bull that is um, a very high quality bull. Now why is that important? Because I sell those bulls out uh, primarily uh, to Southern Virginia uh, cattle folks in Northern North Carolina um, who uh, have commercial herds. A lot of those herds have gotten to be a strongly um, almost purebred uh, Charlet herd. Well, along the way in God's providence, um, uh, there's an operation that started out in Kentucky, um, I believe Winchester, Kentucky, a gal named Laura Freeman. She went to Duke, by the way, which is one of the schools I went to. Uh, and uh, she took a degree in journalism. And after she got out of school, she found out she didn't like the journalism. So she went back to her dad's farm, who was a limousine breeder. And she had gotten very health conscious over the years. And a lot of her friends were health conscious, and they were um, eating trim and lean. And so she said, um, there's a market for lean beef. And uh, I met her in 1985, uh, quite, uh, I was visiting a Charlotte friend out in Kentucky. We went over there one Saturday afternoon. And she says, Mr. Baldwin, I believe that there's a great market for lean beef, and I'm going to prove it. I said, Laura, I sure hope you do, because we're in that business, that's for sure. So uh, I'd kind of forgotten about that. And, uh, two or three years later, I read where Laura sold a million dollars worth of beef. I said, wow. At any rate, uh, we, we uh, got hooked up with one of her representatives uh, and uh, who wanted to buy our Charlet steers, wanted us to have Charlet steers and sell them to their program. Well, we first thought about it because we was, at that time, we were registered breeders. We were selling registered breeding stock by the head, uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, sell all, my, all, all the bulls that we could from the farm. Uh, we were probably selling uh, 35, 40 bulls a year uh, from the farm at that time. And uh, without a bull sale uh, going up in the, in the farms. And at any rate, uh, um, we had all these bull customers that we, had, uh, that we could draw on. So we got the idea, why don't we pull the, the male calves back from those bull customers and stock them and sell them to large lean beef. So that's what got us into that business. That's the problem about the mid-90s. God's providence again. So we got into steer business, okay, bringing the, the bull calves or steer calves back to my bull customers, uh, trying to graze them as much as we could, uh, feeding them on commodity feeds, and uh, sell them in tractor trailer loads to large lean. Now that got us out of the per head sale of uh, cattle to now we're selling um, cattle on the hoof, okay? We're selling by the pound on the hoof, not by the head, okay? We got in to the deal a little deeper with Laura's lean, and she said, why, they said, why don't you keep these steers on the farm and um, finish them for us? Well, we got into the business of feeding commodity feeds more, and we learned that we could finish those steers on the farm. So we developed uh, steers, and then we now sell them to Laura's lean on the rail, okay? We've gone from on the head to on the hoof to on the rail. So now they come along with something called the grid, so Laura says, well, guess what, we got a new program now. We're going to give you more money. We're going to buy to sell you these cattle on the grid. Well, the grid was supposed to be an improvement. So we'll salute that. Uh, so that's another way of marketing, on the grid. Um, that stimulated us to produce a more of a big rear buy, more of a, uh, a lean animal, et cetera, et cetera, which is Charlie wanted to do anyway. Um, so... Uh, and then one day, in God's providence, we had 15 steers that we could not get on the truck. We had had, uh, you know, a nice uh, set of steers, but they wouldn't fit on the truck going to the large lean kill plant. And it was going to be quite a while before we had another batch. And we had these steers. These were 12, 50, 1,300 pound Charlie steers. What are we going to do with these steers? Well, uh, you don't want to take them to sale barn. I mean, that's the last place you want to go. That's the last place you want to go anyway. Uh, so um, we had, uh, in the early years, we had uh, sold some beef, freezer of beef, we called it. So we got out there, list of those people, began to call them, and then we then sell those steers. Got hooked up with a processor again, sold those steers as cutting package beef. 
time we got through, we added up the money. We had made more money on those 13 steers, more clear money on those 13 steers, almost than we did on the track trail load we sold. So we said, there's something wrong with this picture. So we decided that we were going to start selling direct. Now, that was in 19 and, um, uh, let's see, that was, in, that was um, what, babe, that was 19, uh, that, was, that was about 2000. That was about 2000, right. Along about that time, I've been reading more and more about grass fed. Now, I, I missed a part of the story here. Back in the mid-90s, we were trying to graze these Charlotte steers, right? Um, a man come to town in the next county over named R.L. Downripple. Uh, R.L. is from the, was at that time, he was a forage specialist at the Noble Foundation. And uh, my son and I went over, there, went over here, R.L. Now, he had a grazing system that he was laying on the table, proposing that this is an ideal grazing system. And that, and that system was to put your grazing land down in, an, in annuals in the fall of rye, rye grass, a uh, good amount of clover, and uh, then in the spring, uh, overseed that, uh, that uh, uh, winter annual with, uh, with, rye, with uh, crabgrass. At that time, it was uh, Red River crabgrass. And so um, we talked about that quite a bit, and we said, we're going to do it. We're going to try it. And I remember the first field that we tried it was, tried was a 15-acre of uh, uh, orchard grass, sort of in the center of the farm. It, you know, I don't know why we picked that field. Uh, I made two rounds with the harrow and, and stopped. I said, we must be nuts hiring this good orchard grass up to uh, plant something we don't really have that confidence in. My son said, too late, Daddy, go on, get on, get on track, get going. Too late. Right. So anyway, we sowed that field in rye and rye grass and crimson clover and a little bit of red clover. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you right now, that blew our socks off. We, had, uh, we couldn't keep the cattle out of it. We got power fencing and, um, and uh, mama cows around it uh, with, uh, with calves. Uh, they just ran under the fence and get on. They didn't care whether they go back from the cow or not. Just get on that and graze the rest of the winter. So um, we said, wow. So at any rate, the, the steers that we grew out on that was, um, was uh, excellent. The gains we got was excellent. Uh, we did the crabgrass in the spring. The crabgrass come on and in. What we did is very simple. We just took a little herd cedar and went over that rye and rye grass and put out the crabgrass about so three pounds an acre, and doggone if we didn't get a stand of crabgrass right in the hot, uh, hottest part of the summer, June, July, and August. Beautiful. And so uh, cattle kept right on grazing. So we said, this is a good system. And uh, we expanded more of the farm into that program. And uh, so we had that part of the grass program going. When the, when the deer with Lars Lean, uh, you know, uh, showed us that we, we could sell steers off the farm. So in 2001, we cut the ties with Lars Lean. We said, from now on, we're going to feed our steers here at home. We're going to sell them at home. Now, that was a big thing, okay? Big deal. Because we, you know, we didn't know whether we could do that or not. But uh, again, God's providence. And so um, we just put out a road sign and, and um, bought a couple of freezers, and uh, we were, took off with it. But that's where I'm, gonna, that's where I'm now going to enter into the, to the presentation, okay? But before I do, we've got a little three-minute video. One of our customers that has come online over the years and is taking more and more of our beef. They're pushing us more and more to give them more beef, more beef, more beef. We started with one store. I think we got 11. It's Whole Foods. And so I'm going to show you a three-minute video of the farm that Whole Foods came out and made. They opened a new store in Wilmington, North Carolina, which is different than any other store they've had. All the other stores in Whole Foods, you can go in, talk to the meat cutter behind the counter, look at the cuts of meat in the counter, and uh, if you want something different, he'll cut it for you. In the women's store, it's a tray pack situation, already packed. You got to come in and take what's in the tray pack. So they've got this video playing down in Wilmington with this with, uh, screen with this video on it because we're the grass fed store for them. So let's run the video.
I got it now. Yeah, I got it now. Okay. Okay. Okay, now we get down to the winter, winter feeding area and, and uh, I'm getting to share with it. Uh, uh, this is what we learned by trial and error. Um, we first started marketing. Um, we, as I said, we, we put up some signs and put, put in a couple of freezers, so you have chest freezers. And um, then we started going to the Carborough Farmers Market. Carborough is right next to Chapel Hill, uh, which is about a 45 minute drive from us. Carborough is the oldest farmers market in North Carolina. A um, lot of good high income people from the university go there and shop, that sort of thing. And we were the only grass fed grower at that time back in uh, 2001, something like this. Um, now a farmer's market is a great place to start because guess what? You're eyeball to eyeball with the consumer um, and uh, what you sold them last week, they go to want to come back and either buy some more or tell you what was wrong with last week, okay? So it's a, it's a pretty steep learning curve. And I'd recommend that anyone who's, who wants to do this, uh, get in your truck, your car, whatever, the van, whatever you got, and go to your best farmer's market. You might have to drive 50 miles, 75 miles, whatever it is. Now, when uh, Dr. Ed Raven called me last year about this time, he said, Mac, why don't you come up and speak at this conference? I said, be glad to, love to do that. Plant. I didn't think much more about it until time was uh, close. And I said, I don't know anything about West Virginia. So I did look exact, you know, 1.8 million people. Seven, no. eight hundred dollars. Uh, so you've got a little over 200,000 cows here in West Virginia. We've got about 700,000 like cows in North Carolina. But when you do the arithmetic, uh, in West Virginia, you've got a cow for every five and a half, six people. In North Carolina, you've got a cow for every 13. Markers. Now, we're way underpopulated in North Carolina as far as beef is concerned. Um, Virginia, mm, you, might, you might feed off 85, 70, 75, 80 percent of the people in, in West Virginia if you kept all those steers on the farm and grew them out. No way we can do it in North Carolina. So um, uh, most states are importing their beef on the East Coast. That's just the way it is. With cow cave people, those calves leave the farm and beef comes back in to, is uh, finished beef in the feed yard. So, uh, okay. So what? There's an opportunity if you want to do it, and uh, hope these slides are going to encourage you to do it. Um, this one has a really nice look. See what we learned. Contact information. Um, especially email. That's really been their mailing address or their phone number. So I can communicate. Traveling. Uh, call me anytime. Number yeah. one. Now we just went through this litany. We started with selling the cattle by the head. And then we moved to sell them on the hoof. Then we went to sell them on the rail and then on the grid. And we are selling uh, uh, in primals now to, to uh, Whole Foods. Uh, but when you take the final step, you're selling cut and packaged beef. Okay, so Scott. we're now doing more work by selling cut and packaged beef than any of those other systems. So, but guess what? That's where the sweet profit is. Because you've cut out everybody else, you're looking eyeball to eyeball to the person that's gonna consume your beef. There's no middleman, just you and that person. And uh, you set the price. You're not a price taker, you're a price maker. And if you're not making money, it's your fault. It always starts with you. Um, one of the things uh, we learned fairly quickly, and that is that our customers want to know more about us, who we were, where we are, how we managed our cattle, how the cattle were processed, what did they eat, um, how long we've been doing it, was it a family farm, did we buy the farm, uh, blah, blah, blah. It's just, it just goes on and on and on. What they want to know about you. So this is important that you have a good handle on what you're going to tell them. You tell them the truth. Tell them exactly how it happened in your life. And that's, they'll remember it. So, uh, they better like you. 
but that's as far as it's going to go. So it's important that your customer likes you and likes what they hear. You actually you're what you're doing, your product, they see your product, they pull it out of the freezer and eat it, you know, they think they got to put a face on it, it's got to be your face. Um, your okay. Thank you. And, uh, and now let's just talk about the product. That's red beef. What's your number one basket? That's your product. It's that product. You go down. You get to the end, you have to get to the end. After that, you're done. Okay, you must make it you turn. Not only good, um, acceptable, you must make it remarkable. I think on the word remarkable means. Remarkable. What does remarkable mean? That means that the person that encounters your beef and eats it said, wow, this is so good, I want to tell somebody else about it. I want to remark to somebody else about it. And that's the only way this system is going to work. Your customer has become your unpaid sales staff. They have to like your product so good, they're going to tell others about it. First word in grass-fed beef is grass. Green grass, that, lots of green grass, et cetera. You saw the Increase your management ability. Had not been for RL Dalrymple coming through our life, those grasses would not be the, you know, people come down the road and they see our farm and that's the first thing they say, wow. Look at all that green grass, okay? Whether it be summertime or wintertime, okay? So uh, that's important. So uh, work on your grass program. Get your grass program going if you want to sell. If you want to sell a grass. The last. Uh, this is the very first one that I'll talk back to 1990. Uh, um, I guess we had met RL something maybe a couple of years before or something like that. Uh, that's as you can see. That's that's uh, that's ryegrass. That's Marshall ryegrass that completely got, a, got, a, got away from us. We didn't have enough cattle to keep it eat down at that time, really. And uh, you know, what the, what the beef farmer wants to say, oh my goodness, let's, why, let's get the cutter out and let's cut that and make hay. Well, that's the last thing I want to do, I want to graze it. You want to manage it so you can graze it. Leave the hay cutter in the barn, get it so you can graze it. So, uh, it was 70 to 16 inches. Uh, that's, that's, stand, that's a stand of rye and rye grass. Uh, along about maybe a little bit more than the second or third week of August with our plate overseas. Uh, uh, All right, let's go. A purple cow. Anybody ever seen a purple cow? No, you haven't. But if you seen one, if you saw one, guess what? You'd remember it, wouldn't you? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, no one has seen one, but um, going back to the word remarkable. The concept of purple cow came from the Best marketing guru that I know. It's very, it's very uh, difficult. Uh, let's write that name down. Because I want you to go online and Google that and, uh, and buy his marketing books. Purple Cow is one of those. Making your product remarkable. The second one he's uh, got is tremendous. Uh, uh, commission uh, marketing. Turning strangers uh, into friends and friends into customers. Uh, That's his little book, Purple Cow. It's a system. You have to set up a marketing. By the way, he got the um, he got the impression to name that little book that he was working on was really a marketing book, mm -hmm. a purple cow, because he was in France. That was the rest of the deal. So you had to, you know, it was dark and possibly what you think of France and Charlie Cow. So he said, Wow, what they were purple. And that put him to th on thinking about his book. All right, make your customers your unpaid sales. I really like it. Uh, what do customers say about your product? Noise, noise, noise. Email you and tell you, wow, you know that, that cut of beef I bought from you over there? Man, that was outstanding. I got one right for that. Not in the rack. Yeah, I bought a, a 20 pack of beef, what do you call it, 20 pack? Make. What, what kind of steak? If you have a more high amount of you can you can look back and say historically I've been getting more manure on that field than I need. But if you get down into take one line. Best. So. Um, 
about your beef? What is bug? Right. Well, that's what that means when they, um, when they go to Sunday school class and said, guess what, we're eating boiling beef for lunch. Man, if you ever eat that before, it, you got to chuck those in the pot when you go home. Okay? And then, and then you know, everyone would say, well, who is boiling beef? That sort of thing. What, what about that, you know? Um, we got a grandson that's um, a trucker and um, <clears throat> lives across the road from us. And he was up in upstate New York someplace, some, I don't know, boony someplace. He stopped at a little convenience store to get him a catch and a nab. And uh, went in, and the guy behind the counter said, where are you from, son? He said, I'm from down North Carolina, a little town called Yanceyville. He said, wow, that's where Baldwin Beef is. He said, that's my granddaddy. He said, we across the road from me. He said, well, it's good beef. We eat it up here. So he had ordered off the Internet and it up there in New York. Hey. Okay. So, so good work, and I want you to do this. So dumb for word of word marketing. The anatomy of bug. This is a good book. And it's a digital. Uh, the idea is you want your customer to tell other people. And if you go through the and and uh, um, they tell other people and they each one is uh, on, the so on, uh, on the on the phone. phone everybody's got a camera. A million people. I thought Morganton was bigger than this. You only got twenty-eight thousand people in Morganton, for Pete's sake. So it didn't take it, take, it wouldn't take nearly twenty times for that to happen. The power of word of mouth is happening. You've got to get your customers from um, But what makes them talk about your product? And so Here's my list of attributes. That, so these the number one attribute so flavor. Is vulnerable in several areas. The most vulnerable is, is, I think, is uh, the forage program you got them on. Um, I personally think if you try to finish in steers on off of in the fight fescue, you're asking for it. I don't think the flavor is there. In fact, I think it would be negative. So you got to get rid of the in the fight. Um, and I think you uh, you also need to. Uh, Consider annuals, whether it be the ones I'm talking about or some other summer annuals, whatever you know. Annuals have a uh, higher energy and higher sugar content. I think uh, uh, Dr. Garrett agreed with me on this. They have a, a lot of um, uh, more bang for the buck than triennials do. So consider that yeah. program. You got to have, they got to be thin. You got to have, have an enjoyable chew. Now, does it have to melt in your mouth? I don't think so. Um, I, I've got living proof that they come into our place and buy their beef. And uh, they s deliberately select a uh, New York strip or ribeye devoid of marbling. Devoid of marbling. Now, this is contrary to anything we've heard before. You've got to have the marbling in order for it to taste good. Okay? And they love it. So, uh, Got to be decent. I mean, I can't send them a piece of beef out the door that they're gonna have to chew on like like leather. I mean, it's not gonna work. So it's got to have a, a good chew, but not necessarily melt in your mouth. To a farmer, I'd work with. Got to have some real health benefits. Now, wh why does my customer come in and say, "Well, you know, I got to have the leanest beef in this corner right here," it's because they are interested in keeping their uh, cholesterol levels down, or whatever. They've had maybe a heart attack or something like that. Their cardiologist is scolding them. Um, by the way, cardiologists have recently begun to say you can eat red meat again. At one time, they shut it down altogether. So you can't eat red meat anymore. And one of the reasons they shut it down is because the red meat they were eating had so much marbling in it. Now they found out, well, you can eat grass-fed beef. In fact, we've got brochures in cardiologists' office where they give them to their customers. <coughs> um, Gotta have, it's got to be reasonably priced. You can't get ridiculous with this thing. you got you to get a good profit margin, but be, be reasonable. <coughs> you've got to have a good packaging. It's got to be a big one. I see this progression. Is. Years ago, the big name was organic. Everybody's big on organic. We've got to have organic, organic, organic. 
And then they said, well, we've got to have all natural. We don't want any hormones. We don't want any antibiotics. We've got to have all natural. Okay? Then the consumer says, well, we want grass-fed. Um, now, guess what? The consumer says, what's important? I want local beef. It's got to be local, 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 local. And so if you're, you know, if you want to start, I say that, hey, you're at the right time to do it. Uh, you put the signs out, you're a local guy, whatever the community wants to grow that product. No, no, no. If you don't want them, possible. The name is important on what kind of what you put on your product. Uh, for Pete's sake, don't go off and, and put some name on a Triple Creek Farm or something like that, or Skunk Hollow. You know, who, who knows what that is? Put your name on your product. You want to brand your product with your name. And um, because that name is important, because she's got to remember that, and they got to be able to go on the internet and Google that name and find you and uh, tell their neighbors about it and so they can, you know, uh, keep, it, keep it cooking. Uh, Put a lot of times in, in naming your product. Continuous supply. Well, that's a dream of every producer, to have more demand than you've got supply. And um, you can get into that situation pretty quick. You've got a good product. You do all the things I'm talking about here. You, the, the, the market will push you to produce more supply. And so, uh, but. Uh, if you're going to do business with uh, some, some reseller, you can't call them up this week and say, guess what, we don't have any steers for you this week. It's going to be three weeks before we've got any more steers. You've got to be, you know, you've got to build that supply pipeline before you go. Get well, because that really tells us what the status is, or we no, have to we got no way to come from. And look at a plant part to really tell. Well, how do you get started? You know, uh, we get a chance to talk to a lot of young people uh, about how in the world can I get started. I want to do what you do. How do you get started? I said, okay, I got a recipe. I got four things. That's the way you get started. I'm now talking to young people, okay? I said, number one, get you a good education. Number two, get you a good job. Number three, get you a good mate. Get you a good mate that's got the same kind of dream you've got going to support you. Number four, go rent you a good farm. For Pete's sake, don't go out and buy a big John Deere tractor with a four-wheel drive truck and, and all the hay baling equipment you can think of. Go, go rent a farm and talk somebody and let you trust you with that farm, and then you, you start doing what you, wanna, what you think you want to do. And you stay on that rented farm until you outgrow it and go rent you another farm. And you keep doing that until it keeps you safe. Day day. And you keep doing that. In relation to and take care of the stuff. And uh, until you've made enough money to be able to ensure that you can quit your day job and go do it. Or go buy your own farm and keep your day job for Pete's sake so you can pay the mortgage. That's essentially what we did. We, uh, we rented farms for 12 years before we bought this farm, and this uh, starter farm in Kansas City. We bought one farm in 1981. We sent uh, what, four more around us. And uh, we went from 300 acres now to 800 acres. I want um, a five-foot overlap so that I get those, those two parts. I back to the farm about uh, five, six years ago. I got a grandson that's 22, his son. I got another grandson that's 22. Everybody's working on the farm. So uh, um, it's, one, it's, a, it's a matter of um, uh, just uh, um, and uh, doing it so that it's profitable. You know, if you get upside down this thing, it's hard to turn it around. <coughs> what you drunk? Teddy Roosevelt said, look, he said, do what you can where you are what you got. Think about that. Do what you can where you are what you got. That's simple, isn't it? Well, the first thing we did, we put a road sign. We said, hey, we got... We have that record. That's the sign we put. We even called it freezer beef then. We didn't even call it grass fed beef. That's the first time we put up on our place. No Sundays. We said, we're going to honor God today. We're going to be open 9 to 5. Call us. Come see us. Ball and family farm. Response to that process. Yoke deal up there with, a, with two, 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 two and a yoke. Let me tell you a little story about that. 
Um, I'm gonna, how's my time running, Doug? Okay. <coughs> I um, we first bought the farm in Castle County, and I was so um, grateful to God as to how this thing happened. This this, uh, this farm fell in our lap. A, a, a niece inherited this farm, and she wanted to get rid of it real quick. And um, this was when Jimmy Carter was in office. The interest rate was 18 percent. Okay. And uh, she said, I'll say this farm and finance it for 8%. Well, we thought that was a deal. And uh, Peg and I were living in a house a lot in Burlington, and uh, I was working out of a little 19-acre home farm, renting all these other farms around the furthest farm, 25 miles away. And uh, we said, this is it. This is a big chance to move on a home farm and, and buy this farm. So uh, I said, we're going to call it Easy Yoke. That's what we're going to call it, Easy Yoke. Now, why Easy Yoke? Because I've been so impressed with the scripture in the 11th chapter of Matthew, chapter 27, 28, 29. I want you to think about that. Write that down and check it out. For the Lord Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye which labor and are heavy laden. Again, yeah, home's farm be hard work. Now, you're going to work. Come unto me, all ye which labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon ye and learn of me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and you shall find rest unto your soul. Now, what he's trying to say is, you get hooked up with me. Um, a yoke is where two are, are yoked together. Now, one of those is going to be the, the lead yoke, the lead um, deal in that yoke, and he's going to do the main pulling, and that other one's got to go along. Okay? If you're yoked up with the the big steer that's going to do the pulling, or the big lord that's going to take care of you, then it's an easy ride. I said, we've got to call it Easy Yoke Farm. <coughs> well, it didn't take us long doing that. No one in the world knew who Easy Yoke Farm was, you know? Going back to the point, please get your name in your farm. So we started, we called it Baldwin, farm, Baldwin Charlet. We were breeding, we breeding Charlet cattle, and then it was Baldwin Charlet for a long time. <coughs> But then uh, all the family come in the farm. I and my son, you know, everybody's in the farm. So we said, hey, we are a family farm. And this is what people want to know about. They want to know what's the family about. What, how, how, how long has this farm been in your family? That sort of thing. So it's more the right name, which is Baldwin Family Farm. Uh, for I think it is. Okay, there's a good opportunity. 10, 12 years, 10 years anyway. There's that scripture right there I just talked about. Matthew 11, 28, Okay, this is the family. Now, guess what, folks? Peggy and I couldn't make any babies. How do you get a family farm like that? Get the family. God's providence again. Um, God gave us a little five-year-old, I mean a five-week-old, Adopt his son. Big guy on the corner. Where is it? Where is this man? This is the guy right here on the corner. He coming out in our life when he was five weeks old. His mother was a really good college girl uh, from Virginia. And thank God she had enough of God's presence in her life to say, I'm not going to abort this baby. Thank God he wasn't born now because it had been a big pressure on her to abort her child. But she gave him life, and God gave him to us. And uh, it wasn't long after that that we adopted a daughter. Next to Peggy. She was coming to us down at Duke right now. You go in there with a heart attack, she'll cut you open in a heartbeat and massage your heart with your hand. And these others are our grandchildren right here. Now, the one next to my son here, he's going to NC State this fall in animal science. That's Stephen. Uh, the one with the red shirt on, um, Patrick's had some problems. But Patrick's coming out of it, and uh, I got a feeling that it, he's going to be right behind Steve at NC State. Uh, that's right. And uh, the guy in the blue shirt's going to the trucking business. So that's, that's the Baldwin family farm. Uh, you got to develop a nice business card. Whenever you go around people, you got to give them a card so they can then have something in their pocket to give somebody else and some money. It makes you pass out a lot of business stuff. You notice that scripture at the bottom. What? 3 John 2. You know what 3 John 2 says? It's an awesome scripture. Write it down. Don't you think about it. Okay.
Beloved. God calls us beloved. Beloved. I desire that you prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. He said, I'm going to lay down a yardstick. You prosper your soul, guess what? I'm going to prosper you. What's your soul? Let's your mind go to the motion. He said, now that's up to you. You can get my word, make that pro, and give me that, then I'll do the rest. Beloved? So, I don't even know about that. Develop some nice stationery. Now, here again, we made a mistake in the stationery. What are we selling? Are we selling the farm? No, we're selling beef. The stationery should sit ball and beef across the top. Okay? So, uh, again, that either say, you know, we're, our, our product now is national grass fed beef. We're not the stationery, we'll do it again, we'll do it right. The production. Uh, you got to have an oh, brochure. That's our brochure. Soil survey. That's the cap. Put a lot of thought in your brochure. He loves it. That's your inside. You can't do it right the first time. It's about a, what? About third or fourth, fifth brochure. Just keep, just keep uh, working on it. Um, you got to have a good story. Yeah. People will want to know your story. If they know your story, they'll tell your story to somebody else. So give them a chance to know your story. That's the, that's the ball and beef story. We make sure every package, of, every uh, box of beef that leaves our place has got a copy of that in it. So tell us. Got to have some good. This is the uh, latest yard sign up. Now there's something wrong with that sign. That's on the south end of the farm. You come up from uh, I-40. You're going north on uh, Highway 86. We're about 20 miles, 25 miles from I-40. You hit this corner right here. Ball and beef outlet. See those arrows? You'd think that would mean right the road, wouldn't you? That's what, there's a hay field across the road over there. And we've had people turn left on the farm road, go up in there and drive all over the hay field looking for it. We said, what are they doing over in that hay field? Well, come on, so we thought you was over here. That's where the sign was pointed. Well, anyway, there's something else wrong with that sign. It says beef outlet. A lot of people don't know what that means. It, we should have said beef store. No, no, they think they got to buy a whole quarter of beef, a whole side of beef. It's a you know, big farm. You got to have a, you know, about a whole steer, whatever it is. We can't come in and buy a pound hamburger. hamburger. By the way, we get $7 a pound for a hamburger. We run out. So as, as most, most direct marketers, hamburger piles up, sell all the ribeyes, New York strips, filet mignon first. We got so much demand for the good ground beef that, you know, that's, that's a, a quick mover for us. Uh, that's the billboard we got to pretend. Ball and beef. Seven million years down the road. Chance to think about it. Very Ball and beef. Okay. We got around the farm, got our name on it. Uh, name on the farm vehicle. That's an old van that we started to the farmers market. It still got fifteen hundred ran like that. It sold thousands of beef out of it. Okay, that's on our trucks on the farm. Open the farm out. Now that's the free, one of the freezers we started with right there. Uh, we started with a three-car garage on that farm. that came to the farm and put that freezer in. Got and that's what we sold out of. Now this is sitting in um, an addition. And you added, uh, maybe serious seven, eight years out into the field because you have. And we just recently completed, completed another about a $30,000 addition to this, to this uh, garage to make a sales room. That was the walk-in freezer that we started with maybe seven, eight years ago. We've outgrown that one. Uh, that's a new one. Uh, this way through the sun out there. God's Providence. Phone ring one day. Said, uh, Mr. Baldwin, would you, would you be interested in having another freezer? Wow. How'd you know we need the freezer? Well, we, uh, we, we thought you might. Uh, Pepperidge Farm Store in the next town south of us, Burlington, going out of business. Just walk in the freezer. This is about a $15,000, $18,000 freezer here. They said, you can have it if you come get it. Okay? That's a problem. Okay? So, uh, now the customer comes and look here on, on, the, on the left. See the little red basket? Just like downtown. You go over and pick your basket up. Open your door, put your beef in, take a little scales. We, oh, we, we, we uh, 
Got to be NC Agriculture. Our Ag Commissioner in North Carolina, Steve Crosser, is one of the best Ag Commissioners we've ever had. And uh, he's now Chairman of the National Ag Commissioner Association, nationally. And uh, that's, his, uh, that's his program. Got to be NC. Yeah. It's, it's in, it's in science. Yeah. 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 All right. This is a three car garage that uh, we just finished that addition on. We haven't not finished yet. We're going to put a porch on here. And uh, so uh, uh, be able, people be able to back up to the door and load the beef in there and that sort of thing. Um, we got a little shipping office over here on the right. There's, now we've got our computer and all this stuff right where we're doing the shipping and uh, not have to run around. This is the inside where we do the shipping. Uh, that's a new little office built on that. And uh, this is a little building we worked out of. See that sign across the top of that bull head? That's going to be on top of this, uh, this porch that's going to be on here. Okay. So it's going to be Baldwin Beef Store. It's going to say Baldwin Beef Store. And, uh, okay. Uh, is that a problem? Uh, you, got need, you need a good logo. Okay. Right. That's our logo. Spend a lot of time thinking about your logo. Uh, this is a, one of the labels we got on, on some beef that we're selling. Um, uh, it's one of our marketing packs. That's what we call a 10 pack. That's 15 pound box of beef. Uh, Southern Farmers Market. Here's a guy that's uh, looking at a pack of beef at the Carver's Farmers Market. He can't believe he's holding a piece of Charlie beef. He's from France. He said, "Here I am, and look at Charlie beef. That's my. That's where I come from. That's my home beef." Uh, whole Food Store, Weaver Street, Ingles Food Store. Uh, Ingles is a fairly new business. We, they contacted us. We want grass-fed ground beef in our, in our store. They got about 200 stores in Western North Carolina, and um, we began to think about our cold cows, okay, that were going through the sale barn. No, no, hey, this is an opportunity. So we began to, you know, kill those cows and turn them into ground beef, work it slick. Um, we age those cows a little bit, and uh, the beef is wonderful. So, okay. yeah. uh, focus on selling national. Get you a good website. Now, you, you showed your website in the first time, right, right building the first house. Putting it right. right, and so you know, uh, we're on Elk Run. All right, sure. Yes. Are you? Animal welfare approved. Well, there. Believe me, that's an issue. Because one of the labels that we uh, entitled to, to put on our beef is AWA, Animal Welfare Approved. This is a volunteer audit that you can uh, go through uh, annually on your farm, and you you pass the audit, which you can do, doing a good job, yeah. and you're entitled to put your logo on anything you sell. <coughs> Believe me, this is getting more and more important. Um, we're constantly getting phone calls to want to know how, you know, how our, how our cattle are handled, humanely, okay? Uh, especially how they are processed. <laughs> One day for a lady, she said, um, I want to know how your cattle are. Kind of a long pause. Uh, she said, <coughs> die. <laughs> I said, well, uh, we're, we're processing USDA inspected plant and uh, they're, uh, they're stunned and rendered unconscious and they're, they're essentially bleed to death, okay? Long pause on the phone. I don't think I like that. I said, I'll tell you what, next time I have one die natural, I'll call you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, you're going you're to run, run into that 1% out there that, that, you know, that, that wants to, wants to, you know, has no idea what, what, what it's like to, 
just like I believe uh, we saw a slide, might have been in yours, uh, Gary, where he talked about why don't you go to the grocery store and buy your beef and quit killing these deers, mm -hmm. you know, buy your meat. Um, the, um, it's significant in the packaging, okay? It's also significant in the uh, chill room. Uh, he has to have a, a good quality chill room. Um, we age our steers two weeks. Um, Uh, that's the, the, look, the USD inspector is going to make sure that animal's got water and hay in front of him. Or they'll cl if they'll close him down. Okay? You don't have to worry about that. Uh, the USD inspectors are extremely, extremely monitoring these things. My guy had used to have two, uh, two process now he's, uh, inspectors, now he's got six. Okay? Uh, this administration is, is uh, focusing on, um, on that kind of thing. Uh, 